And the Davis is there. Would you say, uh, Sherry? Okay. Today is thirty day thirty two, and uh, the Holy Spirit and the feeling and shaking. We're going to go covering that. But before we get, uh, let me say a prayer. Okay. Our Lord Heavenly Father, God of creation, we come before Thee on this devotional. And we have learned so much about the Holy Spirit, and we're thankful. And we want to uh, use the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we may become hot Christians, not lukewarm. We want to uh, thank everybody that's tuning in. And uh, yes. the Holy Spirit will uh, dwell on each and every one of us. We ask that you be with us during this uh, lesson. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Man. Before I, I started, I, I was going over a, <clears throat> some of the things that we've studied, kind of a review. And I, I got all the scriptures, but I'm not going to read the scriptures. <clears throat> what the Holy Spirit does, and I just have a little list here that I want to go over. He's a witness for Jesus. He quickens. He can be received, can be lied to, can be tempted, given to them that obey, speaks through us can be uh, resisted and you got to pray to receive it the holy spirit i mean with a laying of hands or to receive it also you can buy the holy spirit and uh, the holy spirit sends us where we need to be or where we need to go he can be caught away we can be caught away just like uh, i think it was philip he fills us he comforts us empowers us gives us gifts and it also gives us prophecies. And tonight we're going to do the other part of the Holy Spirit, the, the sealing and the shaking. And wow. this is going to be a very interesting uh, uh, study that we got going here. I want to start by reading that first paragraph. The sealing and shaking are of vital importance to those living just prior to Christ's return. Those who are sealed will be prepared for that great event. Those who refuse to receive God's seal, which allows God to prepare them for Christ's coming, will be shaken out of the church. Well, I don't want to get shaken out of the church. I don't think any of us do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, Also, I, I think I'll read on the, uh, number two, and then we'll have some comments. According to the Bible, God's seal is placed in the forehead, Revelation 7.3. The result of receiving God's seal is to receive his name. In the forehead, Revelation 4.1. God's name and seal are synonymous. When God spoke with Moses in the mount, Moses asked to see God's glory. God said he would proclaim his name and then proceeded to reveal his character. Thus, we see that God's seal, name, character, and glory refer to the same thing. In the new covenant, God promises to put, promises to put his laws in our minds, Hebrew 8.10. In the Old Testament, God commands Commandments were to be as friendless between thine eyes, Deuteronomy 6, 8, which refers to the forehead. Hence, God's commandments are symbolically pictured as being placed in the forehead. Anybody have any comments on those two uh, paragraphs? We have his character. Well, I, I, I didn't realize that all of these were synonymous. I didn't either. God's, but... God's name, sealing, glory, right? And um, what else is character? God seal, name, character, and glory. And we used to always, the uh, same we, thing. we always believed that, uh, well, maybe it is still true, that the Sabbath was the seal of God. And I think it is because down here a little further it says, yeah. and hence the commandments are symbolically pictured as being placed in the forehead. That would include the Sabbath. Because mm -hmm. uh, we were always being thought that the Sabbath was the seal of God because it has all this, you know, the creator and the name. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Besides, you know, the God's name, seal, and character, and glory. I, I didn't know that you could, um, well, I guess you, if any people could, but you can, you can refuse to receive God's seal. Mm. That kind of, yeah. How would, how, how would a person re refuse to receive it? I think it would be by rejecting the Holy Spirit or yes. uh -huh. not letting the Holy Spirit work in us. 
I think that's one way that, you know, that's what that's what it said. The writer says we're going to be shaken out of the church if we do not receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, why the why the forehead? What is the seal? Why is the seal placed in the forehead? Mind that's where our brain is. That's where we think and where we have emotions. That's what we make our choices, right? Your name in your yes. Okay. And our reasoning power. Yeah. No, is is the forehead? Do you think the forehead and the heart the same thing, or is it two two separate things? Well, the heart doesn't think. It no, just, but it has emotions. Well, that's what I've heard. That it has neurons. But in the mind, in the forehead, or the front. That's what uh, in the Old Testament in Ezekiel. I think it was Ezekiel that said. It. Was the, oh no, it was uh, Deuteronomy that said that. Well, it would be like frontlets, frontlets between between your eyes. That's the same thing in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. We receive his name in our forehead. It's synonymous. Like, like, uh, Joe, there's a, that text there, Hebrews 8, 10, is a quote from Jeremiah 31. He will write his laws on our heart and mine so he they're, they're both together when he speaks about writing his law in, in our in our soul in our heart and our mind yeah i know I, sometimes i read about a heart of stone or a heart of flesh and we got to get rid of the heart of stone we need to have the heart of flesh which means we have to have them in our hearts That's and true. in our mind right. Any, any other comments on that uh, second paragraph? Okay, then the sealing, I guess this is the third paragraph, the work of writing God's law in the heart. There we go again, in the heart. That's the sealing. In a previous day's devotional, we saw that the work of the Holy Spirit is to write God's law in our hearts. The work of writing God's law on the heart also is called the sealing which occurs as a result of the infilling of the Spirit. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Now he which establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who has also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts, 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, and to the Ephesians he wrote, In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit of promise, that's Ephesus 1.13. Thus, in order to receive seal, name, character, and law of God in our foreheads, our minds, and hearts, we must receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. According to the Bible, there is no other way. This is why the baptism or infilling of the Spirit is essential for the believer. This is why Paul emphatically commands us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So well, doesn't, I, doesn't the heart reflect the the emotion of love? Yes. And without love, I don't know that we could develop Christ's character. That's, and, great, that's one of the greatest gifts is love. One of the yes. fruits of spirit. Because you without can't love. actually do anything on the heart. The heart doesn't think. But the, when you think of the heart, you think of love. Right. And that's how we should feel about our Savior. Is that why David said, create within me, within me a new heart, Lord? Yes. And put the right spirit in within me? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the church needs a lot of love, don't you? I think we all need to live, love each other a lot more. And I've, I'm starting to see some of that in the church. I mean, there uh -huh. was a time when I first come into the church where there was lots of love, and then it kind of faded off for a bit, and now it seems to be coming back. You remember, Linda, well, well, I remember your mom, Linda, when we used to go to church, we had uh, lots of people in that church. It was packed. It was crowded. There was so much love there. Yes. There was so much. The greeters were so loving and kind, and everybody was kind of teachers, and everybody was so happy to see everybody, and we need to bring that back. And it's coming back. I'm not saying that it isn't, but it's coming back. So that's the love that you're talking about, Linda. Yes. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Yes. Or 
What does it mean to slide? Oh, we're going to go to the, we're going to go to the fourth uh, paragraph. Oh, I mean, yeah. Where Ezekiel talks about the, the sign and the crying. And that probably, you probably have some different ideas on that. Uh, what do you think about that? When Ezekiel said that uh, those, the mark was placed on those foreheads of all that side and cried for all the abominations. What do you think that is? That's kind of a side. I, I don't quite get that, but I, I think it means that those that uh, were sorrow, sorrowful for the abominations that were taking place. Yeah. And those that cried, they cried out to the Lord. I think those were, I think that's what it's saying. But if there's some other thoughts on that, I'd like to hear. Well, I think that means that those who are, I mean, when you see sin, or like there are some Adventist churches that are preaching that the Holy Spirit is just the essence of um Jesus or the Father, that there is no person. Uh, now, that would make me cry to think that I am hopeless without a help, because Jesus said the Comforter would be there to to guide us and direct us, to comfort us in in bad times. He helps us to uh, remember those. Bible verses that you know, you know, and they're shoved all in your brain that doesn't work because it's kind of old. But we know that, that the Holy Spirit is there. And in hearing the things that are being said now, it's you're sighing and crying to God, asking God to um, change their, their ideas or to, you know, help them to get past this. Or any of us who watch our children leave the church and we're sighing and crying out to God for help, blaming his yeah. promises. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think we cry and sigh a lot. We don't like the uh, abominations uh, taking place. and It refers to immorality. And we cringe. We cringe when somebody we're talking to is using the curse, curses or all language. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. when, when I worked in the mail for 40 years and I was in the Navy, those things are just common words. But when I, I've gotten up to this point where every time somebody uses, some of the family members use a lot of curse words and uh, bad things, they speak bad things, and, and I cringe anymore. It, it, it bothers mm -hmm. me. So mm -hmm. that's like, to me, that's like crying and sighing in a way, and there's probably other ways that we cry and sigh. So we need to get we need to get uh, the seal of God in us because we don't like the abominations and the immorality that's taking place. It's repulsive. It says. Mm -hmm. it's kind of, Ezekiel, go ahead. It's kind of a a heads up to us, you know. Are we are we crying and sighing because of the things we're seeing in the world? We yeah. We see the same sex marriage. We see the children that are confused about their gender and, and it's just it's just awful yeah it's, it's become repulsive to us as christians yes it especially is. seven day adventists mm -hmm. just to well, make that, a point that god's, that god's people these immoral things are repulsive to them mm -hmm. it repulsive, like mm -hmm. sandra says we should it should be repulsive to us to see these things happening Oh, and like we, God we, we, to take care of these abominations. And it's repulsive. We see all these shootings taking place all around. And, yeah, there's that too. And the love, the love of many also has waxed cold. If the love of many has waxed cold, that must mean that the love was warm at one time, was yeah, hot at one time. Yeah. So I think it's referring to the Christians. I think the, the love was hot at one time, but it's grown cold. It's grown cold, the whack. The love of many has grown cold. And that's referring, I think, to us Christians as Christians. Because we know the outside world, uh, it's, it's, they're always cold anyway. They don't believe. A lot of them don't believe. But we believe. But we need, a, we need a not wax cold. We need to stay warm or hot. Like we're going to be talking about the hot and cold here coming up. 
Yeah, let me uh, say something um, <clears throat> about that. I it comes to my mind that um, we we can talk about the sin that we see in the world around us, and that is very clear and very rampant. The harder thing to see, uh, and you, and really you can only see it with the help of the Holy Spirit, is the sin within us. Yes. So yes. when the love waxes cold. It's when we as Christians settle into our sins and we do not say, as the psalmist said, 139, 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so when I look around at the world, I do feel disgust. But as I read Romans chapter 1 towards the end, when he's condemning um, specifically homosexuality, he starts the next chapter. The first verses of the next chapter is, do you condemn these people? Well, you guys do the same thing. And so... It's only through the Holy Spirit that we can ask to be shown what it is that we do that's offensive to the Lord. Yes. And as the psalmist says also in 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me a right spirit. Amen. Good. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. So we have to examine ourselves and not judge everybody else. We have to pray for those that are in trouble and, you know, like you said, homosexuality or whatever. We can't judge them because we have our own sins. We have our own things we need to confess and work on. And well, I pray, I pray often that the Lord will uh, uh, remove the plank from my eye before I try to remove the speck from somebody else's eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we're all in the same boat, just different degrees. That's true. Different degrees. I, I pray about it. I, I see stuff and then I say, oh, Lord, help that not to be me. Yeah. I like the word it says, in one of the scriptures, I'm going to paraphrase it, where it says to take off the beam out of our own eye before we reach over and take the sticker or splinter out of our brother's eye. That's right. So we have to all examine ourselves. Mm -hmm. Every day we should examine ourselves. Every day yes. during prayer, examine ourselves and see where we're at. And you know what? The commandments are like the schoolmaster for us to look at uh -huh. to see where, we're, see where we're going wrong. Yeah, but they're not. But they're not harsh. No, they all wrong. make they all make perfect sense. Mm -hmm. It's the perfect law of liberty. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the perfect yeah, law I think that is. It's so it's so wonderful when you study the Ten Commandments that he ends the um, the Ten Commandments with the final one, "Thou shalt not covet." Mm -hmm. um, at first, I thought that that one was an easy one, like it was just kind of like one that I didn't really need to work on. But I had a dream one night recently, and maybe in the last year, where my wife and I, um, Becky and I, were in the dream and we were at marriage counseling. We had just gotten married in the dream and we were at marriage counseling and the counselor said, so what, which guy, what, what, what are the 10 commandments are you working on? And we both looked at each other and we're like, well, we think we're doing pretty well, but I, I guess number 10 covetousness, you know, kind of thinking that it was kind of like not that big a deal. But I realize now that covetousness in your mind and in your heart, leads you to all the other sins. Mm -hmm. And so every day we ask that covetousness be taken away from us. Covetousness is almost like, is about like self-righteousness. You, you've got it all under control. And so, you know, well, I was not, go ahead. I was going to say that's one of Satan's biggest, one of the biggest things that he did was covet. He wanted to be like God. Yes. He wanted to be like the most high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So it could be anything. It could be anything. I mean, obviously it's written down as um, thy neighbor's wife, thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's donkey. 
but we know that the Ten Commandments are then elaborated on um, that, you know, adultery also is lust. Lust is also adultery. Um, anger, unfounded anger is murder. Yeah. And so, yes, what, what is even uh, coveting? Even when we say, ah, oh, I'm unhealthy. Why, you know, oh, I wish I was just, or I, I, I why can't I be healthy like someone else? Like, it's not fair, you know? Well, we know that the Lord gives wounds and heals and um, that the Lord binds up and um, the Lord gives and takes away. So it's in those times of sickness sometimes when instead of necessarily like uh, saying, woe is me, uh, we and coveting someone else's health or coveting someone else's situation that we're given the opportunity to praise him. That's true. That's good. I like that. Any other things? Uh, any other thoughts on this um, paragraph that we're reading? Seeing and the shaking begins at the sanctuary. That's wow. our church, which refers to the church. Mm-hmm. Hence, God's seeing and shaking work begins in this church, spread throughout the world, and affect every man, woman, and child on the earth. Those who refuse to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit will, in the end, be shaken out of the church and be turned to lost. That's a scary thought. Yes, it is. I don't want to be turned to lost. I don't, I don't think any of us do. Well, we got to be careful we don't become too presumptuous also, you know, into thinking that, hey, we're in, everybody else is out. No, we got to pray every day for the Holy Spirit. Every day we got to pray for the Holy Spirit. Every day we got to work out our salvation with God. Every mm-hmm. single day. And not only once a day, maybe three or four times or a day. And even when we're doing our chores, even um, we could be meditating. Yeah, with fear and trembling, is what Paul said. Fear and trembling. You know, though, I appreciate you, you know, everybody pointing out that we have to watch that we don't think we've got the answer and everybody else is out there, you know, kind of doing a little judging on our own. And if we focus on ourselves, we've got our hands full. And if we remember that only God is the judge. Exactly. I have a question. It says here, the sealing and shaking begins at the sanctuary which refers to the church. Okay, so how are those shaken? I mean, is it by the church or by them making a decision to leave? How does that shaking take place? I didn't quite understand that. I think it says something about not wanting to receive the Holy Spirit or ignoring the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Oh, the very last sentence, I see. Those who refuse yeah. to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit right. will in the end be shaken out of the church and eternally lost. In other words, they will make that choice themselves. In other words, we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. But sometimes when my sister-in-law, she's one of those um, Pentecostals, she starts, uh, sometimes when I'm praying, she'll, she'll interrupt me. And she'll start speaking in these tongues, which kind of upsets me a little bit, but I don't say anything. Uh, I wanted to say that's that I don't want to say nothing against it because I'm afraid maybe I'll be grieving the Holy Spirit because I don't understand. I don't understand, you know, maybe maybe they do have the Holy Spirit. But I, I think that to get the Holy Spirit, you got to be obedient and you have to have the spirit of truth keep and keep the commandments and the Sabbath. Yeah. I think you have to have all those things. And they don't. There are Sunday keepers. I wonder about that, too, but I don't want to judge anything. That's up to God to judge. That's right. Anyway, it says here, I'm going to read a little bit of this. This is the very same scenario given in Revelation in reference to God's message to the Laodicean church. Revelation Revelation 3, 14 and 22. I'm going to read uh, uh, reproof. Jesus wishes that the Laodiceans were either cold or hot instead of lukewarm. The cold people can be made to feel their need. 
the hot ones are on fire for the Lord. But the lukewarm ones congratulate themselves that they aren't cold and they don't realize how far from hot they have become. They don't realize how truly destitute of spiritual riches they are. They are blind to their true spiritual condition and don't know that they are naked, devoid of Christ's robe of righteousness. This is the condition of God's church today. Jesus compares them to the revolting mouthful of uh, lukewarm water. The next question was going to be, uh, what do you think about our church? Do you think it's lukewarm, cold, or hot, or half and half? Or We don't want our church to be lukewarm. We want to be a hot, hot church. And that's what we're striving for, and that's where we're headed. And I think we're getting there. Any thoughts on that? Well, you know, being hot or cold or lukewarm is is a one-to-one, -one, you know, only each person can open their heart to God or not. And so if you're, if you're hot or cold, actually, if you're layered to see and if you're lukewarm, you just really don't have the urge to, to follow Jesus. Or you're a member of the church and you keep the pew warm. You, you know, you're, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit at all. But you well, look good because you belong to the church. This is kind of like the same thinking that I have. I think some people in the church are hot. Some are lukewarm and some are cold. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just want to be one of those hot ones. And I ask the Holy Spirit to I ask the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ to have the Holy Spirit in Empower me, empower me to be to be a hot Christian. So are we preaching to the choir here right now? Like everybody in the church that isn't on our Zoom meeting tonight should no, should no, no. be. That's, that's not what we're saying. The choir, the choirs, they're hot for Christ, I think, because they provide us with all those uh, spiritual songs and uplifting. No, that's not what I meant. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you meant maybe they're cold because they don't get on Zoom. No, no. that's the, the term preaching to the choir is the people that are currently involved. Okay, okay that's right. So what, I'm, what my question is, is the rest of the congregation who has no desire to be involved with this 40 days of prayer? We don't know their heart. Only God does. Yes. Um, yeah. You you participate if you want to participate, and uh, if you don't, there's no way to judge what your what your relationship with Jesus is. Yeah. Yeah. And many of them can't join because they don't have the the, the electronics, you know, to, to tune in the way we do. So. Right. You know, uh, Joe. Uh, if if uh, if our church is hot, I think it would be more like Philadelphia, the Church of Philadelphia, not Laodicea, because that's true. Because the word Philadelphia means brotherly love. Uh -huh. That's right. And, and uh, if you read down further, it says, "I will keep you in a time of trial or temptation that will come upon the whole world." So compare that with the spewing out of Laodicea. I think that we have those two options, and it's very similar, he says, but uh, that uh, during the end time that the uh, good fruit will be sorted out from the bad fruit and the goats will be separated from the sheep. And uh, I think it, we have what we have here is uh, if we become hot and fruitful, that uh, we're more, that Philadelphia is a better description of us. I like that, yeah. But I hope that we get out of our slumber here pretty quick and start getting on fire for the Lord and get receiving the Holy Spirit. That we're we're all wanting the Holy Spirit to empower us. This is what we're asking for. It says here that it says here that those in Laodicea are offered the opportunity to let Christ into their lives. So we need which to 
of course, is the infilling of the Holy Spirit and baptism. But what I was going to say is we're, we're going to be discussing this tomorrow in the lesson about okay. Laodicea. So uh, we don't want to go over the same thoughts that we're going to go over tomorrow. <laughs> well, here it says up here that, that we got to buy gold. Huh? We got to buy gold, it says, which refers to faith and love. Two very important yes. aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. It says white raiment means God, God's righteousness. And yes. that I have for the eye so that we could be spirit, have a spiritual insight. Mm -hmm. yes. So maybe by doing the, these things, and we'll, we'll just become uh, hot Christians, every one of us. We're told. Know, go, ahead. go ahead. We're told that Jesus said that he planted a crop and it was all good stuff. And in the night, a, a wicked uh, servant planted a bunch of uh, weed. And uh, the next morning, his servants came to him and said, uh, you want us to go out there and pull these weeds up, uh, tears up? And he said, no, because you might pull up some of the wheat if you try to pull up tears. Mm -hmm. and, and he said that it will uh, let them grow together until the harvest. And then the harvesters, which we're told in Scripture are the angels, will separate the tares from the wheat at the end of the hours. If you, if you go to church and you look at the tares, uh, that's all you will see in the church. But if you go to church to look for, for God, you will find him. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what you're going yeah. to church yeah. for. Yeah, and that's why we're here is to pray for the Holy Spirit be in yes. us and then Amen. to overflow us so we can we we pray for it to come to us to like personally mm -hmm. you, i think you can pray for yourself i i think more effectively okay than, just in general than other people so you pray for it in yourself first and and then as it is overflows then you start to pray for everyone else and then you start to act out and 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 then it, it like for example next time we go to sabbath and we meet at sabbath when you are when you are joyful when you are bearing the fruit when you are uh going to talk to other people and pray with them even though we're not prompted to necessarily during the worship service when you go then um and you feel excited about the lord you're gonna shake someone who who needs to be shaken in a good way when you're on fire, and, and so that's how fire works, is the fire touches something else, and then it gets it. Now, we could pray that yeah, the Holy point. Spirit falls on them, but what I'm learning is that the fire is in me, and it's in us, so it's our job, through the laying on of hands even sometimes, mm -hmm. through the laying on of hands, just like even casually when you're talking to someone at church, and they have a problem, and they say, could you pray for my cousin? He's sick. The best thing to do at that point is not to say, yes, I will do that later. You say, let's pray right now. Put, I'll put, can I put my, my hand on your shoulder? And you pray right there. Right there and then. And that's real, and that's how it works. That's how we lay the hands on, and the spirit transfers through through the physical touch. Now, God can, can, can make it fall on people spontaneously, but there's scriptural evidence to show that it's, it's, it's transferred through the laying on of hands. Amen. Thank you for that, Brian. Okay. I guess we're running out of time. Let me, let me read this um, early writings, page 270. Well, it's, on, it's, on the, it's the last paragraph towards the end there. Mm -hmm. Ellen White was given a vision of the shaking, and she asked its meaning. She was told the shaking would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the Council of the True Witnesses to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it, and this is what will cause the shaking among God's people early writings. We will study this statement further in tomorrow's, like uh, Sharon said, tomorrow's devotional. Okay, we're going to start our prayer with